Okay. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Aram Tawia, and I'm a CEO and co-founder of Letty Arts. And I'm happy to present to you today's topic, which is a game design and development explained. So this is not going to be a practical section, but it's just going to give you an overview of what it takes to build video games, um, especially from this part of the continent. Um, so the gaming industry is, is very nascent, and um, we, Letty, have been playing in it professionally for over 10 years now, and um, we believe that it's time for everyone to jump into the space. So this presentation is, is just going to take you through um, how it's done and, and the process of uh, building video games, and you can also find your part, your part in. Fine. So now you can um, hear me clearly. Good. Thanks. Thanks, Florence. All right. So I'm diving in now. Um, so. My name is Aram. And uh, as I said, I, um, I founded Letty Arts, which is a video game development company. It was founded in 2009 with offices in Ghana and Kenya. And I, um, we are focused in making rich African stories interactive. And we have a popular franchise called Africa's Legends, which uh, has been growing for, for a while now. And some of my proud moments are having a talk at GDC. So that is myself and my co-founder at GDC, which is the Game Developers Conference in 2013, speaking about the emerging landscape of African video game development. A bit about myself. Growing up, I was a very happy kid. I was really, 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 really happy. I wanted to be the first man to go to space. Then it changed to wanting to build remote cars. Then it changed to actually um, wanting to be a superhero. So I was addicted to Superman, Batman, and uh, all these comic characters, which was quite interesting. Then, uh, um, yeah, we played, I got introduced to video games as well. So there was a lot happening um, when, when I was growing up. So um, fast forward to junior high school, I made a comic with my friends. Uh, one was called um, Sword of Saigos. And uh, that comic, I wanted to, to put video games within that comic. And um, that introduced me to QBasic, where um, um, I practiced um, how to program and also turn my characters into motion on the computer screen or see my characters come to life on the computer screen. And that was in junior high school. Then fast forward to seeing um, university, I transformed this same sort of cycles into my final year thesis um, into 3D with my uh, project partner, uh, uh, Francis Dito, and were supervised by a very bold uh, lecturer who gave us the nod, Professor Aqua. And, uh, um, fast forward to now, a whole new industry is starting on the continent, which we are happy to be um, um, trailblazers of. So one of my philosophies is to create a change you want to see. I really believe in working together, working in cooperation in instead of competition. And um, this journey has been remarkable. I've not been alone. I've been with a very vibrant, um, energetic team. Um, um, coming this far, and that the, the, those are my team members, and they can all proudly say that they are working or have worked in the video game development space. At Letty, we are also actively um, um, organizing internship positions for students and anyone who wants to be part of their community. So these are some of our um, wonderful interns who have work with us all over the world. So if you want to intend, you can always send us a message. Yes, and then we also 
I also published my book, Uncompromising Passion, which is uh, the full-time game development book on the continent, actually, documenting my story. I call it an unfolding story to this far. You can get it on Amazon, anywhere you are in the world, to see how I grew up and, um, and why I'm doing what I'm doing today. So I'm going to dive in and give you an overview of the landscape. Then I take you through a practical um, overview of uh, not practice in terms of code, but uh, a much more um, um, overview of how the arts and the science come together. So building a culture of gaming in Africa, how did Letty Arts start? And, and how has the gaming company, how far has the gaming company come? Um, and uh, please, if you have any questions, drop it in the chat section um, so that um, I can... I can answer you once you um, you once I complete, I finish. So <clears throat> this is a continent of Africa. Africa has over fifty-five count of or fifty-five countries, over three thousand plus cultures, over a billion people on this continent. Opportunity growing everywhere. This gives us opportunity to kickstart in new industries because the gaming industry in the West is bigger than the movie and the music industry combined. So we believe that, and Africa is not contributing much to these revenues, right? Which is most almost the biggest industry or the coolest biggest industry. And we would like to make that happen. So a bit about history, the trends of games on the continent and I know you can relate because I can. In the 90s, uh, I'm, a, I'm an 80s kid, so the 90s is part of my early child um, childhood. And I know that we all know even the characters now, Super Mario, Mortal Kombat. Those days we were using Atari, Nintendo, Nintendo, um, Super Nintendo, Sega Master System and all that. So in the early 90s, we all played Mario and all that. So we we're consumers, uh, uh, consuming a lot of these um, games that were not made from this part of the world and we're following the trend closely. Late 90s, um, we got Super Nintendo, uh, um, Nintendo 64, PlayStation, that's where the 3D graphics start, started coming. And we're all gathering around playing these kind of games, mostly within the middle class um, some were able to own these consoles, but most of us had um, friends who had these consoles to play from. Then in 2003, there was a company called Mexit in South Africa that became, that started as a game company, an SMS game company, but did not succeed in games uh, and became a chat platform. It was really successful until WhatsApp came in. I think makes it is no more as a chat platform, but it was very successful in South and Eastern Africa. Um, but it actually started as a game company, so it's part of the history of gaming on the continent. In 2005, my game sort of cycles I made for my final year thesis, and um, I'm putting this in the timeline at this time because that is what is known to me now, but I know other people who had made games on the continent but was fragmented, so we can lump all of us. But yes, we, we, we started seeing some development happening on the continent. Then in 2006, uh, my co-founder now, Wesley, um, made a game, Adventures of Nyangi, which came in 2006, a, a Tomb Raider, if you know Lara Croft, kind of clone, but from the African continent. And fast forward, uh, and then 2007, we saw Luma Ake from South Africa also uh, making these high-end games. Then fast forward to uh, 2009, Sub-Saharan Africa, myself and Wesley combined to start Letty Arts, and we made iWarrior and Kijiji, which was iPhone and Java phones then. Then we started we getting a lot of um, games coming in from 2012, uh, we had Malio, Kiro Games, which started a long time, even before us, but started coming on the scene, mostly with the Aku Games from 2012 onwards. We had Kuluya, which, which unfortunately um, um, is not producing anymore, but had some really cool games. 
And yeah, a lot more cool game companies springing up now after 2012. So this has been an overview of how games have sprung up on the continent. But there's one major thing I want to highlight when it comes to culturalization of games, right? Um, when I say culturalization, it's mostly the look and feel and how well we tell local stories with our games. So from South and North Africa, uh, you can see that they have a much more established game game um, graphics and mechanics, and mostly because they are nearer to Western influence where it's much more established. So as much as South Africa is also growing in development, a lot of Western influence has also um, um, gotten there. So they have more tools and more references and standards to keep. And then North Africa as well, close to Spain and all that, Europe also gives them the opportunity to make really cool games. Then it comes to we the sub 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 region guys, eh? um, central, west, east. We try to do a lot of self thought and um, improve our graphics as we go on because most of us are really self thought. So you can see our graph, and also we also try to tell our local stories in making games, and we believe that that could be the best way to preserve culture. And I can tell you that, yes, it's because the cultural pro problem in Africa, there are a lot of challenges that we face when we are doing these things. Because there are two world gardens in Africa. There's education and there's games. Mostly when you, in Africa, when you start to pick a book and you are reading, you are serious. But when you pick games and you are playing, you are playing, right? And you may get your uh, spanked. Right, so we came from the perspective how to make games relevant on the continent. And um, the best bet that came for us was to dwell on superheroes. And we know Black Panther proved that. And we all know that millions love superheroes. And we all know Spider-Man, we all know Superman and, and Thor and all that. So we also um, brought on board Africa's Legends, which is a whole um, franchise of superheroes and villains across Africa telling the African stories and also fixing Africa. So our villains are the problems, the heroes are loosely tied to historic figures. So basically this is how we fantasize and bring games into the circles. And uh, these are some of the games that we built um, on top of um, this, this uh, Africa's Legends franchise, so that's Africa's Legends. And we also have a platform we call Afro Comics that distributes these kinds of content. So you can get Afro Comics on the Play Store as well. Then we have other examples. We are not the only people making it. Uh, we have um, other cool games, um, Oware from Grey Parrot Studios, and uh, we, we just got the RWC Race Award from an indie developer, Dinasto, and then Orion, Cameroon, and there are a lot of games now on the continent. And I can proudly say that the African video game industry is very much growing, and uh, we, are, we are grateful to be part of it. And you can see some of these studios coming in. Now let's dive into the topic, which is the introduction to game design bit. Um, I'm going to pause a bit since I've not seen my screen. Um, let me see if you have any comments, okay. There are no comments in the chat yet, but okay. So, um, yeah, so diving into the game design bit. Uh, we know that game design is an art and science discipline, an art and science discipline. Everyone is equally important in game design, right? It is science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, a STEAM, a STEAM initiative. And we believe that everyone is important, especially, especially when it comes to the sciences. Science, uh, um, when it comes to the arts, arts is as equally important in game development as it is with science. Actually, game design, I say, is 80 to 90% art, then the programming is the technical, which is the science bit. And I'm going to prove to you why. Um, and for me, I, I normally use 
biblical terms to narrate this because I believe God is a big game designer and he is actually um, playing a game, a big game in this huge simulation, right? Uh, so he chooses his strategy, chooses Israelites, gives them abilities, puts Moses here, go and capture this, do this, give this ability. Like when you think in the biblical sense, it makes perfect sense even when it comes to creation. And I'm going to just put these things down. And this, this is purely my take. It, it, it's, it makes game design um, clearer for me. So I try to just dwell on it and also use that to explain concepts to those who want to enter into the realm. I started a course with Bluecrest University, an online course called Understanding Game Design and Development. You can take that course and also get more from it. So this is one um, from Hebrews 13, 12. They do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels, you know. So let's not forget to make games because you might have just entertained an angel. You will never know, right? Um, I'm not going to put you through the definition and all those things of games because we all understand that a game is, is simply an activity between two people with one person trying to win or which has a competitive component. Now, before you start a game, right, um, we try to first, you let's just take the skill set that are involved in the video game, right? You, when you are an animator, architect, artist, mathematician, sound engineer, business, like we, we need all the skill sets when it comes to video games. There is Though there are degrees of game design and game development, anyone can make a game. Once you play, so long as you play, you can make a game and bring and find a place to fit within the game, uh, the gaming space. And I always tell people that game design is not a set of principles, it is an activity. So you do it over and over again. It's not, there are no set rules for game design. <clears throat> Before you start a game, I make I'll make you ask yourself three questions: that what am I good at? What is my passion? How can I make a living out of my skill? Right? If 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 you want to join this industry or join a team or do anything, you can apply this to any kind of teamwork. Look at what you are good at, what you can contribute, and then what your passion is, what comes to you easy, or what you really want to see happen, then how you can make a living out of your skill. Um, let me just keep again on the okay chat if you have anything here. All right. Okay. So if you just, if everything is going on, you can just type and say you can hear me well. So then I continue. Now, um, the fun in making a game. Game, as I said, is designed in arts and science. So we are going to tackle the art side first. And I'm going to uh, mirror this with creation and see if it will, you understand. As I said, this is game design broken down to your level, explained. I believe that every game has a creator who is a master of everything. And if you look at the creation of the world, right? God created, God is the master of everything and everything is perfectly designed by someone. The world we live in, the atmosphere, the characters, everything that you can think of was designed by someone who is called the creator, which is, who is a God. And in the game, game world, you are the God, right? You are the God. And I'm going to prove this to you that what God made this world in this format, before you make a game, you, you need to create a world. You will create your world. You will design your world where to put the light, where to put grass, where to put the sea. And in doing that, you need tools to build that. So, and this is biblically proven. We all know that in Genesis, we said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Which is Genesis 1-1. So God used Photoshop and, um, and, and 
coral draw and all that to make this world uh, using the heavenly tools. Then um, in parts of Genesis, we said what? And God said, let there be light. So he used, so the atmosphere was created. When you make a world, you have to now paint it, put the weather, lighting, texture, and all that in a very nice way. And, and that's what we do in game. So after you build your world, you put all these cool um, textures and stuff, um, you say it and you also be God and say that it is good. Then you move to the next section, which is the character creation. So over here, you can create all sorts of characters, the trees and all that. But when it comes to the animated characters, which is the human beings, and biblically this is proven, right? God said, let us make man in our own image. So you make, you can create your character based on the theme that your game is. So angry birds, for instance, they, they were making birds and pigs. Right, if it's a chess game, you are making queens, pawns, like right? so. If it's an adventure game and you are making a man like you, then you can now fit in this text to say that let us create man. So, in creating the man, you just use modeling tools, right? When you create characters, they are static, they have no life in them. And uh, if you draw a character, it has no life. So all the characters that you see, they are just static characters, not animated. This mesh that you see, that's how the characters are created. So you can use Character Studio and all that to build your characters. Then after you build your characters, you have to animate them. And I've also biblically proven this, that after God made the clay, as from clay, what did he do? He animated us. So he breathed into our, our nostrils the breath of life. And so I can say that he used motion capture frame by frame animation to make our characters come to life, right? And this, these are all the art, art processes. So in a layman's term, this is how much I've broken the art side, how you create the characters, you animate the characters, and you do all sorts of things and put them within the gaming environment. Um, okay, I think I'm off. Um, let me see who's calling me. Just a minute. Hello? Yeah, hello. Yes, am I? Okay, just a minute. I'm in a meeting. Let me call you back right now. I'll send to you on WhatsApp, please. Am I back? Okay, um, sorry, sorry about that. Okay, um, sorry, I thought one of you were the ones calling me. I kept having a call. And I thought I was off and one of you was trying to reach me. Okay, sorry about that. Um, let me get on it. Okay, um, so, so, that is the that's the animation bit of of the whole um, art side when it comes to video games. Then, after your character is animated, how do you program it with artificial intelligence? That is where the because when you finish the character, the character doesn't know that it, it has to use the eyes to see the hand to walk, uh, uh, the hand to, to pick stuff, the legs to walk and to jump and do all that. That is where the artificial intelligence comes in. And I know a lot of people have heard of AI, AI, AI. Fine, in games, AI is like your friend. You, you work with AI from scratch. And I use a term here to actually let you understand that God also use AI on us. And he said that for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. The code that you write for your character, 
can never be wiser than you, the one writing it, right? So I know there is a technical, um, or there is this school of thought that AI will come and rule the world and stuff like that. They will be more intelligent than human beings and all that. Look, the thing is, AI, computers do things very well. They execute instructions very well. So if you tell a computer, walk from here to here, it will walk from there to there very well, right? So as man tries to put in a lot of um, um, instructions within the computer realm, these computers tend to do those things very well. So if you want the computer to, uh, to learn from past experiences and do stuff, they do it very well. But they can never be intelligent than you, the one who wrote it. They can only execute what you told them to do very well, but in a very um, direct way if you don't program them to, um, to behave so. So in Corinthians, you can see that this proves the point that we are never wiser than our creator. So I'm going to take you through um, how computers execute instructions. So when you write these instructions within your code, when you write these instructions within the, the game that you are building. So this is a, an AI term. In, a, in game development, there are terms. This is a finished state machine. Um, this is um, a finished state machine is one of the terms or formulas used in video games where you give computer or computers react with states and conditions. So this, these are four conditions that I listed or, or I've given in one of my games. And the first instruction, and the computer executes it line by line. So as the computer executes, the character acts accordingly. So the first instruction is wander along the path if you don't see or hear an enemy. So the, so the character will keep wandering along the path. So long as it has not seen an enemy, it's moving up and down. Then the next instructions, when you hear an enemy, look for the enemy. So when an enemy um, makes noise or the condition says that the, uh, the here is maybe when you are um, between, um, let's say, 50 units closer to this character is a here, or you jump or you do something, it's a here, and then the the instruction says, look for the enemy. Then when you see an enemy, chase the enemy. So the next instruction, so when I look for the enemy and I now see it and meet those conditions, the character will chase the enemy. When you reach the enemy, attack the enemy. So these are instructions that are given to the characters. So every character in the game have a set of instructions, a set of rules that they execute all the time, which is their AI. And you can hear a term called NPC, which is non-playable characters. These instructions guide those characters. So as the player moves and changes the conditions within the game realm, the non-playable characters are always listening to these kind of instructions. And you can see in a bigger complex game, it's just a bunch of all these instructions happening um, in, a, in very fast ways. And, um, you, and you see that the game is playing as if um, it's something that looks real. And I know that this, this, this AI war has been between game AI and robotics AI. In the robotics AI are, are saying they code the real AI because their AI has to be intelligent. And the game AI is, it does have to look intelligent, right? Because in the game it's on the screen. If you are not showing it on the screen, it, you can stop the AI, but for the but for robotics, the AI has to work. Else, a plane will be flying. If it doesn't work, it will fall. Right, an autopilot plane. It has to work. So yes, but when it comes to the logic, they are all the same. Games are great for simulations. So if it works at the game level, it would work. Then there's another um, AI method we call pathfinding that we use. So you have the A star algorithm that we use in video games. And there are different forms, uh, heuristic search, informed search, and all these things. So A star is a combination search um, search mechanisms. And uh, after working in a room in a game as if it's intelligent, but it's all following a set of instructions. Um, 
interactions. Then there's also physics in games. So those who play car racing games or soccer games, FIFA and all that, you, you see the ball bouncing and people shooting and stuff like that. These are all very complex codes that are executing, right? And if Newton said, what goes up might come down, yes, it works. So in games, you are able to test that. So, there, so, it's, so you can see the science bit of gaming coming that way. And these are the parts that make game development seem as if it's difficult. But no, the art side was the one doing the beautification, the design, how the game should work. And the science side is actually work and playable. So they all work hand in hand and you can work in those fields. Then, then you see collision. So even in car racing games, you see cars colliding or soccer games, people colliding, angry bears and all that. Action and reaction are equal. These all work, right? And they are all put in this big bubble of, um, of what we call uh, um, physics engines when it comes to video game development. As I said, all of these come together to make a game. Any questions? Um, you can type it in there, but fine. So no questions. I'll be completing soon, and then we can enter the interactive side. So they all come together to make a video game. Now, when games are being made, there are some categories that you need to make them fit. They are called genres. So we have adventure, arcade, board, music, shooter, fighter. All these are genus of video games, right? And um, before you make a game, you can pick any of these mechanics, right? The game has to fit some mechanics or you can be original about your game mechanics. I think myself and my team, we are trying to make some weaving game, like how we can simulate this um, can they weaving things into games. So this is free idea for you guys. Um, and we are trying to see whether it fits an existing mechanic or we have to come up with a totally new mechanic which would be innovative and fun. So, so these are ways when you are making a game, you need to look at the mechanics. The game mechanics is how the game is played or what makes the game work. That is the game mechanic or, or, or fun, right? And in also designing a game, after you choose the mechanic, you can test it with a target group. I think the most important person in the group is the target, is the consumer. If the game works with the consumer, then it will work with everyone. And I use the human-centered approach, making sure that you are designing to the service of the consumer, service of people. Else you make something cool for yourself, but the other person is seeing something else, right? You think that but no one is wrong. You've made something cool, but the customer is also seeing something wrong. So to avoid this, you need to have a human-centered approach where you spend time with your focus group or do some research before you start putting some budget to the video game. Then I'll give you an overview of roles in the game company. Game companies have thousands of people working on parts of games, all these big, big AAA games. We have the, but then we have the indie game. If you are even an indie game, which is a single person, you still work with a team. And uh, this are okay structure to use in a team. And they can be one, one, one of each for a start, right? You have the, uh, the programming side. So the blue guys will be the programmers, the science, and then the green guys are the artists, right? The rest fit neither in science or art, but they, I consider them the business guys or, you know, and the, probably the vitamins of the arts and the, the sciences. So you have the producer testers, game testers, sound engineers, um, VFX art guys are all the core artists and the programmers, engine programmers, network programmers, and game designers. And even just today, I recruited a game designer for a project that will be executing. So yes, game design is a team effort and you can always find your spot. Um, we made Kamza with one of my friends, Farida. She was a, a, the script writer on that project, right? So you can have that, um, a typical list is this, the, uh, the team building side, which is game designer, story writer, artist, programmer. Then you can now bring the, the rest 
And then the most important bit is the one in bold, which is the consumer. The consumer is, is very, very important. Um, so mostly the rest, um, I've said more in my course on the um, Bluecrest um, CPD page, but in a nutshell, this is how games are designed. And I'm going to end with one of the most important components in video games that need to be produced. Before you make a game, the design has to be put in a document that we call GDD, right? Game design document. So you can have GCD, which is a game concept document. It can just be a synopsis, a write-up, a short write-up. Then we have GDD, which is the game design document, which is the actual um, design document. And I can show you samples. And the development process of a game is quite intense, right? Um, you, you have to um, have your concept, have the concept art and all that. I'll show you some, some examples, which is not in this presentation. I will, I will share something quickly. I think I have about um, 15 minutes more. So I'll use the next 10 minutes or five minutes to show you. And then you can ask me questions at the end. But before that, these are the, um, the individual, some of the tools that you can use for game design. So you have game engines. Game engines are optimized sets of APIs or libraries that talk to the graphics card directly and also make game development easier. So you have Unity Construct 2, Game Maker, and then you have the native development, which is the Java, the GDF, HTML5, and all that. So these are all very cool, cool um, tools that you can use. If you want something to read, reading materials, you can you can jump on the game dev. If you want to write for games and then the art and sound for games, you can also do that. So um, I'm going to stop this a bit and then show you um, some examples of uh, the, um, uh, um, the game development process. And then we will call it uh, a day. So I'm opening the next presentation just to show you some visuals of how um, or some games that have been built, right, um, from the previous presentation. So basically, um, mostly when when you are building a game, um, this was a presentation that I made, um, which fits in. Um, you can have um, an agri-tech, health tech, like it fits a certain category now that we have the SDGs. So what I'm going to talk about is mostly integrated ed tech. That's where our Africa's legends fall. So we are integrating into some existing cultural or existing education necessity, right? Which um, in, in Africa's legends, our work process has been arts and science. So if, if you look at some of our, our game design, we do the story development. So you can see this story, this is how the story is like. Um, a story writer just writes a normal story. Then we, the programmers, which is the gamification process, we pick this story, we look at it, and then we extract parts of the story that will fit some color code. So here you can see combat, dialogue, diffuse track, lock picking, navigation. So we extract these parts from the story that is written. Then the, the then we plan it in a form where it can be programmed or, or gamified. So we call it the gamification process. So this is, this is an, in an Excel sheet where we list all the chapters and then we go chapter by chapter, stage by stage, just to code or plan each code. And this is all apps, no code has been touched yet. And as we do this, the concept artists also start their work. So it, so you can see environment and concept art and with the concept art we do a lot of research so if we want to make a character based on a tribe we research the tribe and then we try to take reference imagery and make concept artists try to visualize the characters in our development process then we color it and we show it so we do the same this is a character we call anansi so anansi also the, that's our own ghana character we do a background check and see how to visualize it using stuff that are around. Then we have the Maasai character. We look at the Maasai tradition 
and see how it will look in the near future Africa when we conceptualize it. Uh, we do that for the uh, Nigerian character as well, or yeah, on the Yoruba, then we do that for roads, uh, our villain character. Then uh, th that's the fun way for the character development. Now we come to the signs that I talked about. So these are actually um, work. This is an actual game that we are building, and, and that's a process. So you can see the flow chart that you learn. If you're a computer scientist, this screen should be very familiar to you. Um, and then we do the segmentation in text, and then we, we experiment on the gameplay. So this is a game that we are writing called Africa's Legends Reawakening, where we want the game to be playable by text. So everybody can receive a text like, like uh, uh, Africa's Legends, need your help to save the world, join the team now, blah, 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 so, so you can reply. And also make sure that a game happens in the mind. A game shouldn't always be the game that you play on the phone. It can happen as text or scan, scan and win and all those things. So those are some of the, the things you can use. So this, so this is how the game looks like. These are some cool visuals from the game that was built by, yeah, Ghanaians, really cool artists. And as I said, they all come together. And we need to also, after you make the game, you need to publish it to market. And in publishing it, you can use the Play Store, Apple App Store, and all that. They are publishing outlets. You can use publishers or you can do self-publishing. And we also have our own publishing platform called Afro Comics. So if you have comics, you have animation, you have books, you have mobile games, you can send to us. And I think we have some, some partners already publishing on the platform. So on Afro Comics, you can have all these cool artworks on the platform. Then, yeah, so we use the same, um, um, the same um, uh, process for almost all our games, right? We, we use for Kamza, um, which is the, uh, the cerebral policy game written by Farida Bedway, um, which is a game and a comic. And uh, you can see... Um, and these are some, some visuals. And the process of making it is you need a writer, concept art, artist, story, script writer, then a storyboard artist, review for feedback, inking, coloring, paneling. So that's a process for building the comic. And then you can publish on Afro Comics. And these are how the concept art looks like if you, are, if you intend to make anyone like that. So... In general, we've built an, a number of games, and I'm um, just showing you a portfolio. I think we have the MTN Hot Seat so that you can check out on the MTN domain, mtnhotseat.mtn.com.gh. Um, you should be able to play the Hot Seat, which is a trivia game. Um, you can have a character like Kofi Annan being your quiz master, asking you questions, and then you play to win the rewards as well. You can even play on smart TV. So you have to look at the platform that you want to deploy the game. So these are all real projects that are out there. And I'm just showing you this for you to understand that to make a game, you after you make the process, you can build it together with a team, right? And, and then publish it with partners. And um, like for us, in, in this case, we, we've gotten some publishers to do stuff. And we also partnered other studios to make games. So you don't have to make it yourself. This is an example of a game that um, Letty partnered a Nigerian company, Lyrox Africa, to make a game, right? So all these are scenarios that, that um, you can use in making a video game. Um, yeah. So I think I'll end my talk here and then we will, I'll, I'll, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much. And um, that will be the end of my presentation. Thank you. If you have any questions, kindly ask me.